Well, my name is Steve Miner. I'm, I'm very happy to be here at Closure West. Today's talk is going to be about uh, the Data Reader's Guide to the Galaxy. So the inspiration for this talk comes from Douglas Adams, who's a British uh, humorist, and uh, he's best known for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So that was uh, where I'm stealing some of the better lines for, for this talk. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I knew as a book, but originally it started as a radio show, and then they made it into a TV series. Uh, the book came out, and um, even after uh, Douglas Adams died, they made a movie uh, based on Hitchhiker's Guide. So um, the idea that he took the same material and reused it in different ways, um, even thinking about scripts where the, the roles had um, labels and maybe had different actors playing the parts, um, that corresponds to how uh, we're using data readers to uh, deal with tag literals and using the same concepts, but maybe with different uh, concrete implementations. So uh, Douglas Adams has shown us um, really excellent reuse of uh, his source material. Um, as software people, we'd like to do the same kind of reuse. So. The guide aims to be the uh, standard repository for all knowledge and wisdom. So in this half hour talk, we're going to try to get most of that covered. Um, we'll start with the basics about uh, uh, tag literals and uh, data readers, talk about a few things that are new in Clojure 1.5, um, cover uh, Eden, which is uh, kind of like uh, JSON but for Clojure, and then uh, at the end we'll talk about a few unorthodox ideas some things you can do with data readers that uh, maybe Rich didn't intend you to do. Okay, starting with tag literals. So, the, tag, um, the format for a tag literal is the, uh, the hash character followed by a, a symbol, a fully qualified uh, symbol, and then some other literal data that Clojure already knows how to read. So, that might be a string, numbers, vectors, anything that we already know how to cover. It also would work with another uh, tag literal, so so you can get more complicated if you want to, but I think for most people, we'll just start with plain literal, literal data. The tag is telling you some kind of information, some way we want to interpret this uh, literal data in a specialized way, but it's a weak form of uh, contract. It's not as strong as saying this is a particular type or class, or even if you're um, saying, well, it has to fulfill some interface. It's just saying there's some concept here that uh, we want to um, implement in your uh, code. So for example, um, there's the inst uh, or instant kind of data literal, and that um, transforms a string into an actual instant in time. We'll talk more about that. That's built into Clojure. Um, you can say that these tag literals are self-describing data. And self-describing might be a little too strong a term, but the the idea is that you're giving it some kind of label so that people can know what this data is, rather than just saying, well, by convention, I'll give you um, a long, and you should just treat that as a certain number of milliseconds since a reference uh, time. Um, you can actually implement, um, maybe it's a Java class, maybe it's a record, or maybe it's some other just uh, closure data structure, but you can choose um, a particular concrete implementation for that uh, tag literal. Now, we also say that it's loosely coupled to the implementation. So you may have one choice in your application for these tag literals, one interpretation of this data. Someone else might choose to do it a little different way. And in particular, there might be other programming languages, other sources of data, other users of your data that are using the same um, print representation, but with totally different concrete um, realizations in your um, code. So, I think the whole motivation for this was to handle data transfer where Clojure is not necessarily in charge of everything. And you can think of, you know, even between Clojure and Clojure Script, there are some differences in the concrete implementations. So this is a way to kind of cover over that, um, give you a way to express ideas without demanding so much from the other side. And it gives you an open concept here. Um, and it leads to what we call the extensible reader. Um, instead of having the reader know only you know, the predefined Java types, now you can start adding your own types that the reader will just understand, or at least you have a chance to teach the reader. 
how, how to understand um, your notation for these tag literals. And you can customize it to your application. Other applications might use a different uh, implementation there. So in a sense, this is a limited form of common list reader macros. Um, I think Rich has done a good job of, of not just saying, well, closure is kind of a uh, common list, but without a bunch of things I didn't like. But he's, he said, you know, ideas have to be useful. And he's collected a lot of good ideas, not just from Lisp, but other programming languages, and um, composed them so that, so that they're a coherent whole. And I think he was trying to be careful about not putting you know, reader macros right into the language immediately from the start because we weren't sure we wanted all that. So this is a way of getting some of the functionality that uh, common list has in reader macros, but uh, in a maybe more controlled uh, form. Now, when you're thinking about data readers, um, I want to remind you that this all happens at read time. So this is, you know, when we're taking the textual representation of your program and converting it into our closure data structures, then those that result from your um, data reader is what gets handed to the compiler. So you're, you're working at, at the, uh, the kind of top level of just what the reader is, uh, is considering. And the compiler doesn't really know until you're done um, returning your result from your data reader. So the way you control what uh, your data readers are going to do, how they're going to interpret these tag literals, is by um, this uh, dynamic var called data readers, or, you know, with the earmuffs on it. Um, that's initialized by a resource in your project. If you have a, a file called data underscore readers.clj, um, just at the top level of any, of any of your jars or top level of your project, that should be a literal map. And that identifies for a particular tag symbol what data reader function we want to call. So um, it's a map of. Um, Var, uh, tag symbols to var symbols. And of course, uh, at runtime, you can bind data readers and um, control the interpretation more, more specifically for a section of code. So let's take a look. This is a, a kind of a contrived example, but uh, it's, it's simplified so we can fit it on the screen here. Um, this function, my reader, takes an argument. Uh, just you get one argument, but you can make it a vector. You can make it a map, something else that that um, will combine multiple values. But in this case, it's a vector of two elements, um, and then we're just going to multiply the first element by ten and add it to the second element. So we're expecting numbers here, and you can see we do a binding for data readers. Um, the tag is a fully qualified tag. All all the um, in your user code, you should have a namespace on your tags so you don't conflict with other, other um, libraries or other users. Um, Clojure has um, some built-in um, tags we'll see in a second that they don't use a namespace for. So we're declaring that my reader is going to be um, the data reader, how we interpret any tag that looks like um, my.ns slash tag. And then I'm calling read string and giving it a string um, with our tag and a vector, you know, the vector notation there with two numbers. So then the result there at the end is 42. So you can see how we um, did our, called our reader function, returned the 42. Then that gets handed, you know, back to closure, compiles. It's already a literal, so, you know, there's not much evaluation that has to happen there. But you can do more complicated things. Okay. If there's no, um, data reader uh, defined for a particular tag, Clojure will take the next step is to look at the predefined default data readers. So you can't control these data readers. They're just built into Clojure. Um, in particular, there's UUID, which will um, give you a unique key or unique value if you need that for a key or, or some other um, way of identifying data in your application. And the nice thing about UUID is that you don't have to have any central authority helping to um, coordinate these unique values. Um, it's an algorithm that means that you're very unlikely, even two separate machines, ever to, ever to have a um, conflict there where they might generate the same thing. Um, inst is uh, closures abbreviation for instant, so it represents an instant in time. And as the guide says, uh, 
Time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. Um, I feel the same way about daylight saving time. But uh, that's a little bit of an aside. So inst, uh, the definition for inst is um, from the RFC 3339. Uh, it just um, defines a way of um, printing string, uh, the string representation for an instant in time. And we're trying to, we're trying to say it's an instant, like a UTC, um, or the same instant all around the world. Okay, so you can abbreviate. Uh, there's a few examples here on the slide. Um, you have to give the the um, the most significant um, part of the uh, the date time first, um, but you can leave off the other the other uh, pieces, and we default you know to appropriate kind of zero values. Um, so you can just have a, a simple date. Um, it goes um, all the way to an offset. We don't use time zones in. Uh, time zones are so complicated and political, we just use the, uh, the numeric offset, so it's, a, it's hour and minute offset. And you can think of those as resolving back to the Zulu time or the, the um, Greenwich Mean Time for uh, UTC when you're comparing things, but um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And you can get all the way down to nanosecond resolution if that's what you want. Um, but by default, uh, Closure is going to use Java Util date as the concrete implementation for an inst. Um, date, unfortunately, is, is maybe one of the worst object-oriented you know, classes ever defined. Um, I think Sun's kind of embarrassed about that, and most of it's deprecated, but uh, it's still the best uh, kind of general um, class we have for handling uh, date and time, or it's commonly used. Um, I think if, if uh, Java had done a better job, um, a better date, maybe um, none of this uh, would have been necessary and date would have just been built into closure. But because I, you know, this is my uh, interpretation, but date's not so good. A lot of people don't like it. Um, jo uh, the Java people came out with a better um, class to try to, I don't know, improve the API a bit with calendar. And they made calendar um, with a richer API um, got rid of some embarrassing kind of um, constructors they had with the original date. And calendar is also um, sensitive to the offset, um, which is a little bit inconvenient for some people, but uh, it preserves the offset. So if you say my, uh, my time is situated in a certain offset, you know, implying a certain time zone, then it will remember that, whereas a, a Java util date is always converting back to UC UTC. Java SQL timestamp um, added nanosecond resolution, um, a really strange implementation on timestamp. Um, I think uh, that's another you know, big mistake that the Java people made early on. But um, the point is a lot of databases want nanosecond resolution, so they had to do something different, and they kind of patched it on to uh, the existing date. Um, and they even have some like embarrassing wording where they, they they uh, tell you, well, don't use parts of date, even though we're inheriting, we don't really uh, mean that. Uh, it was kind of a convenience for implementation. And so time stamps, so all these um, Java dates that, that, that exist now are kind of embarrassing and not, not well designed. So for most of the Java people are using something called Jota time. Um, and in Clojure, we have a, a CLJ time wrapper over that. And I would say if you're doing serious work with dates, that's probably um, a good library to use if you have to make calculations with dates. Um, you should look into that. Then um, finally, um, there's JSR 310, which is um, Java's, I don't know, maybe it's their third or fourth try to get their um, dates right. Um, the uh, people who worked on Jota time are, are creating this new um, standard that's going to be similar to Jota time, but have nanosecond resolution um, and a few other changes, but they, you know, lessons they've learned from Jota time. And this is scheduled to go into Java 8. So someday there'll be a new um, Java time there. And they say they'll backport it to um, Java 7. So um, you know, I don't know how soon Clojure will ever get to requiring um, that version, you know, Java 7 or Java 8, but um, you will be able to use um, JSR 310 someday. So I, I'd say it's about time Java got time, uh, time right. 
Uh, we mentioned UUID. That's um, just a way of getting unique uh, values, and um, you can call out to the uh, Java to get that. And then a couple of other examples. These are um, just things that people might do with uh, tag literals. So again, it's, it's simple. The tag, there's the, the um, hash sign, then a tag name, a symbol, and um, then some kind of data. It might be a string. The last one here for coordinates, you could imagine doing um, um, latitude and longitude as uh, two floating point numbers. So. Now, this is, uh, if, if your tag is not known, it was not declared in your data readers, it's not built into closure, then uh, normally you'll get an error. But there are cases where you want to just handle things that maybe you've never, you, you haven't anticipated. And in that case, um, closure in 1.5 has added default data reader function. So this is a dynamic var that you can bind to your own function and you'll get a chance to decide what to do with that unknown tag. So it defaults to nil, just like closure 1.4, and that will give you the error as usual. But if you bind it to a function, we'll call the function with the tag and the value. Okay, so it's a little different. The regular um, data readers just get the value. You, you presumably already know the tag. Um, but for the default data reader, we'll give you both. And then you can return the default value, or a literal value that uh, will pass on to closure. And so here's an example of something to talk about for a default data reader. Uh, suppose you had a record called uh, tag value, and it had a, a fields for tag and value. You might define a print method on that so that it prints nicely, and you, you would just see you know, the hash tag and then the, the value after it. Your default data reader function um, can use the record's um, factory method. So whenever you def define a factory, Closure will define this function with the arrow and then your um, record's name, and it takes the field. So we've ordered the fields in the same order that uh, the default uh, data reader function wants to see it. So you can pretty simply um, get that function to work uh, and handle you know, unknown uh, tags as a record. And in, if you look here at um, how records and tags print, they're pretty similar. Right, so if you're printing a record, um, you'll see that you have the namespace and it ends with the record name, like, so it looks like a Java class, then followed by a map. Now, one thing notice, there's no space between the, um, the record part of the name and then the, the map notation with all the values that are the field values inside your record. For, you can uh, imagine doing a tagged representation for that that's very similar, but um, you know, the last period, now we need a slash because we want a fully qualified symbol name there. And um, we need a space because a, uh, for a tag literal, we do the tag, then white space, and then the value that we want to interpret. And this, in this case, we'll interpret maybe the same map. So your default uh, data reader to handle any kind of uh, record, if you use a, the tagged um, notation, we can look up from your tag, we can look up the um, factory method and then call that. And I'm saying here that maybe you don't want to do this in general because you don't want to you know, accidentally you know, accept all the typos and things. You might restrict your um, default data reader just to handle a certain namespace that you think you, know, you might have a, um, you might be using your application and you might um, restrict it to uh, handle you know, just a capitalized tag. Um, so this is, a, I think we can read this. Um, the first part is just defining a, a method to get your uh, factory uh, method by taking apart the tag. And we just um, take the name and, and put map arrow in front of it. Then our default reader in this case is being careful. It's only going to, um, it's looking to see, well, if I have a map value, if the first character of the, of the tag's name is capitalized and I can find a, a record factory for that, then I'm gonna call that factory um, with the value. If I don't see that, then maybe I'll just treat it as a, an unknown um, generic tag value. So this is a way, if you're, if you're just processing data and you're seeing things that you don't understand but you wanna pass it on to some other process, this will allow you to um, 
to tolerate those unknown values. If you're a library author and you're creating your own um, tag, that uh, you know, these are a few ideas that uh, you should consider. First thing is you, know, you have to document what, uh, what the semantics are for your tag, um, what kind of base literal value you expect people to um, give you if they're using your tag. Um, you know, maybe it's a string that's kind of the most generic, but um, you know, it might be something else like a vector um, or any of, really any of the closure data literals that are already predefined. Um, you should think about what your implementation types are. Uh, typically, I think in Clojure, you might want to use a record, um, or maybe you're connecting it to a Java class that already exists. Uh, I think in your library, you, should provide, you need to provide some data reader functions so that um, the users of your library can decide. Um, often, it's just one data reader. But as you saw with the, um, inst, uh, the instant, um, Clojure provides um, three different kinds of data readers to handle um, you can the basic date or the calendar or the um, the timestamp. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the print functions in a minute. But uh, if you're if this um, data literal uh, that you're defining, um, your tag is going to be really owned by your library. You might want to define a print method so that you know, your particular implementation always prints that way. If it's something that um, is maybe used by other um, Clojure applications or other Java libraries, um, maybe you don't want to define printing because that's kind of like taking ownership of that uh, particular um, concrete type, right? The print methods go on the concrete type. We'll see that in a second. And in some cases, you might want to define in your library um, a data readers.clj if you really own that type and nobody, you don't want anyone else overriding it or putting, you know, putting their own uh, data reader on your type, you could define it. But in general, I'd say don't uh, include a data readers.clj in your library because that's kind of your, your library then would be taking you know, control of that tag so strongly that uh, your users couldn't um, override it and do their own thing. You'll get a conflict if, if there are two different data reader, um, uh, two different data reader resources that define the tag a different way. Okay, so for printing, if you're interested in printing, you can take a look at um, in the closure source for instant CLJ, and you'll see the um, definition for how to print um, the three different kinds of uh, concrete um, dates. So Java util date, Java util calendar, and Java uh, SQL timestamp. And one interesting thing, and I'm not sure how I feel about this um, completely, but Print dupe is basically ignored. Um, the idea behind print dupe is that uh, if, you're, if you need to have a you know, very specific, you want to recreate the exact um, class that was being used, um, there's a, a closure notation for, for um, capturing that class name. So when it recreates the literal value, it uses that particular concrete class. So like if you're printing integers and you want to say, I got to preserve this as an integer. I don't want it to go to the default long that Clojure uses. There, there's a way to do that, but most of the time you don't care about that. Um, in our date um, printing code, we're just saying, okay, we're never, we're never going to want to preserve the particular concrete class. We're just going to always convert into an inst and um, let our users do what they want to do with that. Now, there's a few gotchas if you're defining your own data readers. Um, the first thing is if your data reader returns nil, you're going to throw an error. Okay, so normally you wouldn't want to return nil anyway, but um, when I was doing some experiments, uh, I just said, well, what would happen? And um, I got an unhelpful error. That's the worst part. So if, you, if for some reason you did want to return nil, then uh, just return um, this, an expression like quote nil or quote on the, on the list, quote nil. Because um, that, that will be handed back to the compiler, and that will end up um, returning a nil in the, in, as the final evaluation. But you'll avoid this um, unfortunate error. And I think that'll probably get fixed um, fairly soon. We had a patch for that, but it didn't come in time for um, closure 1.5. Um, the other gotcha, if, when you're picking your tag names, you want to be fully qualified, but in the name part of the tag, so after the slash, 
Um, don't use a period just um, for now because uh, that will lead to an error. It's, it's, um, that's just uh, a kind of an accident inside the closure source that um, that's not supported right now, but I think that's intended to be supported down the road. Um, and just uh, to remind you, all the Java date classes, the concrete um, types for inst, um, are immutable. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't ever mutate um, you know a value you've handed to closure. But um, if you're getting it from some kind of user interface element uh, and it's wired up in a bad way, you might end up changing the underlying value. That would be um, that would cause confusion in your in your closure code. So just uh, make sure your dates don't get mutated. Okay, on this example, I wanted to show you just um, how inst works, the, the long form. So those first two um, expressions are really the same instant in time, right? Because we um, take the offset, subtract the offset, so that's a negative seven. It's like adding seven back and for the hours. And um, so those will be the same thing. That's true. But if we're using um, a calendar as our concrete type, calendar remembers the offset. So they don't compare equal unless the offsets are exactly equal. So just be, be careful about that if you're using calendar. Okay, the next, uh, next topic is about read eval. So I know maybe half of the people in here earlier were, were kind of new to closure. So read eval you may not have heard much about, but uh, let me go over it quickly and then um, you can maybe understand what's going on. So I call this the read eval kerfuffle because we had um, in the community on the mailing list, we had um, some issues about uh, what was happening with read eval. Um, this all started because Ruby on Rails had uh, some vulnerabilities, and in fact, um, I think uh, several um, Rails sites were compromised, led to a lot of um, problems in the Rails community. They had to really um, work hard to get some things patched, and that was all due to um, maybe a YAML parser that was allowing um, code to be executed. You know, it wasn't um, the intention of the people who put put the um, system together, but it was just an accident that they left um, this kind of back door open. Closure has a, a similar facility for um, allowing you to execute code at uh, read time. Um, and by default, read eval is true. So read eval controls whether or not um, you can use a special notation. It's the um, hash equals and then some expression, and we can execute code. Um, that's, um, that's a useful facility for a lot of what Clojure needs to do, but it's not safe. If you're reading untrusted data, you can't just hand that to read or, or evaluate some string you got from a user with read string um, without being careful about filtering that. So the issue there for a lot of people, though, is you know, if you know about read eval, you know what you have to do, you can protect yourself. But a lot of um, people who are coming you know, new to Clojure may not have known about this. The documentation you know, didn't really call this out. You had to, you had to work a bit or um, you know, go to some of the conferences and hear about this before, uh, before you'd know about it. So um, there are a couple of bugs filed, um, a few complaints on the mailing list. Closure 1.5 was about to ship in release uh, candidate. And um, the first uh, you know, back and forth was, well, you know, do we really need to deal with this now? Um, enough people complained, I think, that finally uh, Rich decided that, um, you know, he'd just say, don't panic, guys, we're going to do something about it. So the first thing you need to know is that Clojure Read, right, was this, uh, the, the guide says Clojure Read was designed by hyperintelligent pan-dimensional beings. And by that we mean, you know, all the great list packers going way back to the beginning. You know, um, Common Lisp certain has this kind of facility where you can evaluate code in the reader. Um, as we said before, read is for trusted input. Um, some of the you know, experts knew that you had to bind read eval to false, but even bef before 1.5 came out, even with read eval false, you could still execute uh, Java constructors. And if the bad guy was clever, he could think of some you know, Java constructor that could cause problems for you. Um, but we needed to do something like this to handle records, right? Because we're, we're trying to construct, um, essentially, um, Java instances on the fly. So the issue here, the, guy, the guide says, a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. 
Um, that's a little harsh, but I thought it was funny, so we threw it in. <laughs> okay. So the, the solution that Rich came up with, I think this you know, turned out really good in the end. It was a little rough getting there, but uh, Closure Eden is a new, um, new namespace, new facilities. Um, it's a new way of reading that's safer. Okay, so we get rid of the, um, the sharp equal construct altogether. We're not going to call any Java constructors. Um, we're just going to allow the notation for what's uh, known as Eden, and we'll get to that in a minute. But this is giving you a facility that's safe for reading data um, you know, from, say, users or you know, untrusted sources. This will never execute code. So closure Eden read is similar to read, but uh, a little bit different um, in the way you manage um, your data readers and uh, the default data reader. We're, we're going to take um, a map of options that define the readers. Um, well, there's three things. The end of file, how you, how you, um, what you return at the end of file, what your data readers are that we're going to use for reading, um, and what your default data reader is. So instead of using the dynamic vars um, and doing binding kind of in a global sense, um, we're putting these options right into the call to read. And it defaults, it's very similar to the, the closure core read. It defaults to um, the in stream, and it will use the default data readers. And read strings, same idea, but our input is coming out of a string. Now, another solution is to use uh, the contrib library, Closure Tools Reader. That's written completely in Closure, um, so it's accessible. Um, you can take a look at that and make changes if you want. It, um, they've done a good job of keeping up with whatever Closure is doing on, the, on the, the main Closure Reader. They're including now an Eden-only reader. So you'll get the same kind of API, but in, um, in the Closure Tools Reader um, namespace, and this works back all the way to Closure 1.3. So if you have old code, you should start using, take a look at Closure Tools Reader. If you have old code and you're calling read, you're probably better off going to the, um, the new Eden style of reader. It's safer. So what is Eden? Um, it's a similar idea to JSON. It's an extensible, uh, it's known as the extensible data notation. There's a web uh, site that will take you to the, um, the details of it's kind of an emerging um, standard. Um, it handles all the closure data types that you'd expect, um, including symbols and keywords. And of course, the important thing, to make it extensible, it handles tags, tag literals, or it defines the syntax for tag literals. Um, and we're now getting other implementation, implementations for other languages, so you can think about sharing data using an Eden notation. Um, it's kind of making the world safe for closure style um, Printing, closure um, data notation. So I'm calling um, Eden like the Babelfish of uh, data formats, and the Babelfish was something from a uh, Hitchhiker's Guide that allowed people to understand other languages. It took care of um, worrying about translations for you. So the guide on XML, when we're talking about data formats, we always have to start with XML. The guide says, in the beginning, XML was created. This has been made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. So that's, uh, I don't know, the, the guide is opinionated about some things. So XML is important. And we all have to deal with XML. Um, it's a little bit complicated. Um, I call it the Encyclopedia Galactica data formats because, you know, it is common and it's, you know, very strong standard. Uh, but, you know, going way back to the beginning, I think of XML as um, S expressions with better marketing. Um, and even um, Tim Bray, the XML expert, kind of concedes the point that S expressions would have worked fine, but at this point, everyone likes XML, so yeah, XML kind of won there. JSON was a um, reaction, I think, to the complications of XML, and um, Douglas Crawf Crockford uh, describes it as a uh, fat-free alternative to XML. He's also said, you know, the good thing about reinventing the wheel is that you get around one. So, he, he really emphasized, let's make this simpler. We don't need all the complications that the, um, you know, the experts create in XML. Um, one issue with uh, JSON is that it's not extensible, and people get around that by using conventions and object encapsulation. But 
I think uh, maybe with Eden we can do a little bit better. Now JSON has kind of shown the way to do something other than XML. So, and it's a huge success. Um, Eden you know, wants to follow in its footsteps. But it's extensible, it's a little more formal in, that, in the way it's extensible. Um, it has some more base types which are useful. Um, the, you know, the closure symbols and keywords. Um, a little bit more syntax, but it's worth it for our, our extra types. And um, there's maybe a, a, a different angle that you know, closure is about value. So we're conveying values, uh, not objects. And our, our last point is it's slightly cheaper. And by that, I mean, if you're already in closure, um, Eden is, is natural, it's what you're used to. Um, and JSON is a little more work. If, uh, if you're in JavaScript, then of course, you know, or some other language, maybe, maybe Eden is still more work um, to deal with now. All right, so I have to come to my unorthodox ideas. We're gonna go quickly through these. Um, so if you're thinking about Roman numerals, the usual thing might be, you know, we have a way to parse Roman numerals. Um, usually you pass a string. But um, think about what data readers get the first shot at the data. Even a symbol, a bare symbol, no quotes, um, is available to your data reader. Um, it's a little unusual maybe to see a symbol there and have a special interpretation of it. But your, your reader will get first shot at that. The compiler will never see that, that, um, that symbol there coming after your tag. So even if you had that bound to some value, it, that's not what would happen. So, you can take apart symbols and do, do something interesting there or reinterpret symbols using a um, tagged uh, literal. Um, people sometimes complain about the prefix notation for math. They want something better. Of course, what they mean is RPN. But, uh, <laughs> so, but you, could, you could easily write an RPN uh, interpreter there in your um, data, data reader. And, uh, but you, I, I was suggesting you want to expand that into the usual closure notation. Some other language might expand it a different way. Then that gets evaluated as you'd expect. Um, SpyScope uh, is um, a library that I saw from uh, David Greenberg. He announced it on the list a while ago. And it, this was kind of a clever use of uh, the um, tags, not so much for creating new literals, but just um, kind of for the convenience of you can just use it for debugging and um, tracing. He was um, dropping in his uh, spy um, slash D notation in front of any form and then get, giving us some debugging information. That's a bit, I used to have my own debugging macro where, but I had to call, you know, regular macros. So I had to wrap the parentheses just right or I'd use print lens, but again, you'd have to wrap it just right and you have to change your code a lot. The idea here is that you can drop this annotation right into the code anywhere in the middle and it's still doesn't disturb the rest of your um, rest of your code, so it's easy to get in and out, and um, it's I, I don't know I think it's more useful than Printlin kind of debugging. Then the final kind of crazy idea here is um, my idea for doing a conditional feature reader, and in this case um, I'm calling it condef for uh, so it's, it it looks kind of like a cond in that you have these pairs of some kind of test and then some kind of result. Um, but the test here is a special DSL um, with um, the usual kind of combinations. You can and, or, not. And then we're taking symbols, but we're interpreting symbols. So I'm kind of ripping apart that symbol, JDK 1.6 plus. And that means, okay, I'm talking about Java, the version 1.6 or greater. So the plus at the end is interpreted as or greater. And CLJ, you know, 1.5 dot star. Um, the dot star means any version of 1.5 but it wouldn't cover, like, say, 1.6 or 1.4. And with combinations of, of those kind of um, what I'm calling feature identifiers or feature versions, you can do interesting things. And this is all happening at read time, so the um, compiler will never see any of the, the um, conditions that don't uh, succeed. And in this case, you know, reducers are only available for if you're using Java 1.6 and using um, Closure 1.5. So if, if you're using Closure 1.5 on the older version of Java, reducers won't work. Um, and then else is another just literal. I'm interpreting that especially is always true. Okay, so in summary, the tag literals are mostly harmless. Um, Closure Eden is your safe space, and uh, data readers are open to all kinds of crazy ideas. And finally, if, uh, if you're interested in Douglas Adams, 
Uh, check out TowelDay.org. The 25th of May is, uh, is a day we um, all wear our towels to uh, remember Douglas Adams. Okay, that's it. So I've used most of my time. Maybe I'll have a second for uh, any questions. Sorry, I can't see anybody. Uh, okay. Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, yes, you can pose tags because you just think of the um, the kind of rightmost tag gets interpreted as some kind of data, you know, some literal, and then that's the value that gets passed back to the you know the the leftmost tag. So yeah, they'll work that way. But it does get a little complicated, especially if you're using all kinds of crazy concrete implementations. That means the other tags have to know something about those. Your your other data readers for those tags would have to know how to handle those other classes. Okay. Well, thank you very much.